Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. In the studio, waiting to be profiled, is designer Beatrice Amblar and artist, calligrapher, Judy Donan. Beatrice Amblar was born in the eastern part of France and finished her undergraduate schooling in Paris. She lives in San Francisco where she owns the April in Paris boutique. Beatrice, you went to the Chambre, Chambre de Commerce. <laughs> yes. How do you say it? <laughs> the Chambre de Commerce et d'Industrie de Paris. And what kind of school was that? Well, it's a professional school where they teach people how to do different crafts. Uh, they teach uh, in, for the restaurant business, they teach for uh, the woodworking business, the leather work. So it's a professional school? It's a professional school. And do you have to have, what kind of schooling do you have to have before you get to the professional school? Well, in France we have a different system for schooling. You either go into a higher um, school program oh, where you, you continue on until you um, are about 18 or 19 or you decide to learn a craft and, um, and so you go into a professional school. Why did you decide to go into this professional school? Because I loved working with my hands. Oh, so I you was were going to do girl and something? Right. And but not an artist. You weren't going to go to art school. No. Originally I wanted to um, go into a school where I could restore old antique uh, furniture pieces. Oh, I see. And, uh, and then I stumbled into the leather craft and, uh, and fell in love with it. And you learned everything about leather at this school? Well, you learn the, basis of the basic about leather. You learn about the tanning process. You learn about the cutting part uh, for the manufacturing part. And you learn how to do the hand sewing, the saddle stitch, and the finishing. And so you learn few things about leather for two years. How, lar how large was your class? Were there a lot of students in it? Uh, there were two classes of about 16. Is that right? That many people interested in leather works? At the time, yes. Is it the same now, do you think? Oh, uh, I think it's pretty much the same for the most part. Uh, I haven't been in touch with the school too much, so I'm not sure, but... Uh. So, so when you come out of a school like that, do they um, assure you of having a professional job, a job where you can go and actually work? Well, yes, they did. They, they did because of you? I mean, does, do all the students feel like they've um, reached a certain s a part in their life where they're able to do something? Yes, and once you graduate you usually have a place waiting for you. Uh, we also, through the two years process, we uh, have to find um, a company where we can go work for, for them for a month or two during uh, vacation. Oh, like an internship? An internship. Well, and you have to do that on your own or do they send you to p places? Uh, they sent us to places to give us addresses of places we can contact. Oh, they did? Yeah. And you ended up at Hermes, which is like the cream of the crop. Exactly. <laughs> so you yes. must have been number one in your class. Well, I was among the first few, yeah. Did, they ta did, did Hermes take a lot of students from there? No, they took about six out of the 32 that were training this, that year. Uh-huh. And so what happened then when you finished school? Well, then I graduated after my two years, and I started working for Hermes, and I had a six-month, I guess it was about six months, uh, apprenticeship with them and with their specifics, because their requirements is really, really high. And once you pass the six months, if everything's okay, then you're there for life. And most of the people there are there for life, aren't and they? And most of the people, yes. People who design the scarves have been designing for years. That's and, right. And th the only thing new that they're doing probably are, is the home, h home and children's. Yes, or did they, they have, always do that. That's right. They have new, they have new um, programs, I guess, and new articles and items that they're creating now that are different. But everything else was uh, hundreds of years old. Yes. And so you walked into something. When was it? 
Well, this, their business started in 1837. So you so walked so. into tradition. That's right. And formality. Mm -hmm. And did you actually work at that bench with people who'd been there 50 years? I did. I did. did. <laughs> I trained with one of the first women that was actually working for MS because originally they were saddle makers and they were only, only men working for them. Oh, when did they start having women come in then? Well, about 25, 30 years ago, they started having women, and I, I was trained with one of them, oh. one of the first few women that started working there. Oh, that's very interesting. So I had a very high, very intensive training. But and, was it uh, tough? Is it hard to use the needle and use the instruments that they use? We're just learning the whole process of creating a bag, all the different steps, and because it's done in such a traditional manner, we really had to work with detail and, and um, understanding for what we were trying to do and perfection was a requirement which um, is not always easy to uh, obtain so. So would you say each one of those bags that came out of there was a total totally individual? I mean it wasn't mass market but they had to be made exactly the same right? Exactly. But so were they a piece of art, would you say? They were a piece of art because one person was making their own bag and each of our, oh. each of our work was part of ourselves. All the things that we learned was coming out of into, into a bag or into a belt. Or, so we really had to put so much of ourselves into a product. You made the whole bag from beginning to end? Pretty much, yes. Oh, I see. So I well, learned the very traditional methods. And then when did you decide to go on your own? How, you were there for several years. I was there for about 14 years, yes. Wow. <laughs> and four years ago, I decided it was time for me to try to do something with what I had learned and, uh, and create my own style. And you opened uh, April in Paris Boutique, or did you go out by yourself before you opened a boutique? Well, I went out by myself, and I uh, tapped into it, went very quietly and started with very little and um, had a little workshop that I was sharing with a friend and I did that for two years. Was it a leather person that you were sharing with? No, the funny thing is it was uh, a woodworker and wood hadn't been my, had been my first love. Oh, so That's what I wanted to do originally so I was able to combine wood and leather which was pretty incredible for me. It was a great environment to be in. When you went out on your own did you need special tools or special materials? Yes, I needed certain equipment that I didn't have. Where did you get those? Well, I did a lot of research, a lot of research, and there are a lot of places, not a lot, few places in the, in the U.S. that accommodate um, in the machinery and the equipment uh -huh. department. So you didn't have to get it from Europe? Actually, a lot of the things I had to get from did Europe. <laughs> well, I use all, all my leathers are French, so I had to order all my leathers from France. Uh, all my threads are French. And, and uh, why do you think it's French instead of like your leathers, instead of Italian or Spanish where, you know, they're so known for their leathers? Well, I was very used to working with French leathers and I think they're tanned a little bit differently and I really love the way they feel and look. And, and you can and, tell. And I was familiar with some of the tanneries so it was easier for me to work with them and the language too. And then would somebody come in and order, say, a bag like this? Uh-huh order it and say, I want a bag. They come to you and you make custom-made bags. I want a bag. Mm -hmm. And what would you do? Well, I asked a few questions. Uh, because all the bags are made for one particular person, I asked them if they want an evening bag, a daytime bag, and if they want shoulder strap, if they want handles, if they want anything they need to have. Um, and then from there, I create a bag for them. So would this bag be for a particular person? Yes, this bag is uh, for a client. So it has its own personality. It has this client's personality. Yes, definitely. And it's uh, one of a kind. Most of my bags I do just once, and I don't do the same thing again. I don't do the same colors again. This one has a ro rose gold clasp, 18 karat rose gold, and so that's beautiful. the first time I'm using <laughs> rose gold. Is that right? Yes. On here? It's a solid gold piece. And then the color on the inside? Yes. And the so handles are different? Mm-hmm. So she chose all the colors and uh, we made the bag bigger. We did um, a lot of different things to it. Do you draw it then? Of, do you draw it for her to see or do you I just don't start? Draw. I oh, you don't. I cut a pattern from my inspiration. I have no drawings of my products anywhere. Oh, you've got to start doing that. 
Well, we need those. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful. I take pictures once it's do finished. You? Yeah, yes. good. Yeah, I do. And that. so uh, everything on this bag is hand stitched, hand done. Yeah, completely. And we have an and and it matches obviously the personality of the person who ordered it. Yes. Yeah, well, I think people usually know. I mean, women are very uh, tend to know what they like, especially in purses. Because so. I mean, the psychology of it, trying to decide what to yeah, do you, for someone. You have to get to the core of things with people, and it's uh, it's a very interesting and fascinating process for me. Let me let me show this bag too. This is fabulous because it's two colors. This wonderful clasp that comes out like this. Beautiful. And I use the same leather inside as I do outside, so it's uh, the same so leather on the inside. Yes, it's the same thing inside. And, and this looks like outside. it's some kind of a skin. It's alligator. Mm -hmm. And what kind of a person wanted this? Um, well, this is actually part of uh, my line, so I've done this bag more than once. This is the first time I'm doing it in black and red. And different sure. colors. Different you've done? colors. I do different sizes. You can specify the size if this one doesn't fit your need. And that little one you have there? Well, that little one is a very special one. This is Stingray. And I've wanted to do a piece in Stingray for a very long time. You mean time. St Stingray skin? The fish. From the a stingray. fish? Yes. But it's a very difficult skin to work with. And I was always afraid to, uh, to start cutting into a skin that I didn't know if I could work with it. And this came out, I got up one day and decided that that's what I was going to do. So I cut the pattern and I built a bag and there it is. I lined it with uh, green suede. And this bag is unique. I'll never do this shape again. Or what this about, will you, use this? will you use this skin again? I will use the skin, yes, because I think it's a very interesting skin for evening, but I'll never use the sh same shape. What did you put in here? That's the skin. That's, that's the way the that's skin the natural, came? Yes, that's the natural process of the skin. It looks like pearls. Yes, that's right. Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, it's here too on the back. Uh huh. So I shaped the bag around the shape of the skin, basically. That's how I designed it. That is absolutely magnificent. And so we've, we've been talking here, dealing with colors black and red and rust and brown, which are pretty normal. but. You have these here that you brought too that are so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I also use goat skin. This yellow one is goat skin and mm -hmm. I use um, soft calf. The inside is gray. So I like to play with colors a lot and do things that are a little bit different than what you normally see. Beautiful. Stitched in yellow. Yes. Gives okay. a little contrast. And, then and, and one more. This is also stitched in yellow. And this is lizard. And yellow on the inside. And yellow inside. We can oh. have fun. This is accessories. This should be fun. And I love to do colors. They're so beautiful. And a great belt. And the belts. And I design my own buckles. And I have them made uh, by a jeweler. And they're solid 18 karat gold. Wow. And I also do that in rose gold and yellow gold and white gold. and. April in Paris must be the best place to come in San Francisco to see your work. It's a fun place. You can see me do the work. You as actually you shop. have it, do you? Actually, I do the work in my store. Yes. Oh, I think it's so great, and I'm so glad you came down from San Francisco to be with us. And I think if all of our listeners can get just to go and see what a craftsman you are at uh, your April in Paris boutique and let you show them how you do the hand stitching. Yes, I think it's a, an important part of the process that I really want to keep. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank You're you welcome. for Thank you. Um, being with Beatrice today. And don't go away because we'll be right back with Judy Donan. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with artist, calligrapher, dancer, Judy Donan. <laughs> Judy is a native Angelino who attended all the good LA schools. <laughs> Carthay Circle, which we love, John Burroughs, and LA uh, High, Los Angeles High School. She headed back east to Connecticut College, then to the Juilliard School in New York City. Uh, when you when I finished your bio, I found 
that you went to so many other schools as well <laughs> that maybe you're overeducated. I love being a student. I love learning and, and it's so creative. You get to just do anything you want in the classrooms and it's so inspiring. I think it was funny because we talked about Santa Monica College and you had just gone there not two years ago. Exactly and thank goodness because that was the end of the whole college, the, the year that I the went. The art school, the art college. Right. right. Design, art, and architecture, right. and the and the faculty was phenomenal. With well, you know, with Laddie George, Dill. Laddie Dill, George Herms, Lisa Adams, Deborah Sussman, Ann Troutman, Ann Thornycroft, Peter Bob Alexander, Bob Wilha. Yeah, I don't want to step it was over incredible. your names <laughs> because those are the California names, yes. and they were all teaching there, all and teaching. they had little seminars. I was on the board, so I was very familiar exactly. with what was going on. But let's get over uh, your overeducation. <laughs> let's get back to Juilliard, which is pretty cool to be able to go to Juilliard. And you went as a dance major? Dance major in, do I have to say the year? <laughs> no, don't say the year, but I'm going to tell, tell our audience who you danced with and they'll figure out the Oh, years. okay. Well, it was um, actually before that, when I got out of high school, I went to Connecticut College in the summer. It was a school for dance, and oh. that was, um, Merce Cunningham was teaching there. Oh, is that how you, why you went to Connecticut College? Mm -hmm, you were always mm -hmm. interested in dance? Always. Did I you started 13, I was about 13 when I really just loved to dance. Well, were you taking dance classes here? Yes. In Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. Like, from whom? Well, Ellie Johnson and um, Bill Hyden, Richard Oliver, and up at the Hollywood School, I, I studied up there a little bit. Just wondering, because for you to have this phenomenal background in dance it had to have started here, and obviously mm -hmm. with good mm -hmm. teachers. Well, it, it, was, it really was New York where the whole thing happened and clicked. And uh, it was also Archie Savage, I, was, I just remembered in Los Angeles, which was African dance, too. Uh, so you danced with Merce Cunningham. You studied. Studied, <laughs> okay. Jose Limon. And Martha Graham, and they were at Juilliard. They all were your teachers. Mm -hmm. And did mm -hmm. you see a difference in each one of their styles? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, Limon, uh, I mean, well, all of them had the most phenomenal presence about them and uh, their stature and it was magnificent just watching and them. And signature choreography probably for each one, uh, uh, each yes, one had yes. their own Yes, Graham style. Is, is the the whole you know, pained contractions, yes. And Cunningham more? Totally loose and free like Twyla Tharpe and, and just mm. very free. And Limon? Um, well, God, how can I define it? it? It was just typical modern dance, really, I think. And you did it with Turn bare out, feet. barefoot. In fact, I went to an audition in New York for West Side Story, for several auditions. And in West Side Story, I was asked to come back to the finals. And another audition I was asked, I was told that it would be nice if you would put shoes on instead of coming with bare feet. <laughs> but I learned that at Juilliard. Yes. <laughs> it's true. It seems like for you, the 80s was your art time. Because mm -hmm. I looked at the bio and I saw you had shows all over. You were doing a lot making art. Mm -hmm. And why, was, why did that? Did that come out of the dance? Or was there some reason? Uh, I think I... I danced, yeah, exactly, through the 70s up to the 80s, and I was in some groups, and we performed just small venues around L.A., mostly. And uh, then I became a Montessori teacher. I, I, I started oh. to study Montessori and lettering, and that's, I don't even know, the years, it, it's all befuddled. But um, from that, and my brother was an artist, and then I became interested in art, too, and I just decided I, I had to do work with my hands and do it. I know everything on the set today is yours. Mm -hmm. They're all pieces of art made with found objects. The one next to you, mm -hmm. um, the box. Yes. And I, I think most of them move. And I... Oh, because that's very... It's like an outgrowth of your dance. Right, right. I see. This I didn't realize that. Yes. This piece here has wires. It, it just... Well, as a matter of fact, 
I, I remember reading something once, when you have a house filled with children and everyone leaves the nest, sometimes people have commotion in their homes so that there's noise, constant movement and noise. And this was one of the things I started thinking about. Oh, that's The very, possibility. And the other thing that I saw on this is it looks like the opening of a book. It looks like the pages of a book. Exactly. This is, a, they are, these are books. And, and, and this one, it, they're like shrines or um, containers filled with whatever words or secrets or anything that books are filled with, which is words are another thing that uh, the whole calligraphy thing comes from, too. Well, that's just what I was going to get to the calligraphy. Okay. <laughs> How did you get into calligraphy then? Going to more classes. Right. <laughs> exactly. More. Studying uh, to be a Montessori teacher. Ah. They don't teach the round, the ball and bat lettering. They don't teach, they teach italic. I'm going to just show some of these commendations that you've made for the county. Mm -hmm. Because every time someone does something of notoriety, mm -hmm. the county or the city or the, wherever you live will have some commendation drawn exactly. up for you. Exactly. And of course, this is an outline of what is there all the time. Right. And then you do, do the inside. We can create anything we want, and their name, and then any kind of a design or leaves or flowers. Stanley Mosk, a wonderful jurist, and I see the uh, <laughs> blind lady right, of right. law. I want to show one to Halle Berry. And these are Xerox copies. They're not real. Yeah. They're just they're Xerox. Mm -hmm. And Halle Berry inspired you to put a white rose. I, I believe it's something about, it's a Silver Rose Award recipient. Yes. Okay. And so then I'm going to show you this, the Chinese American Museum. Mm -hmm. and, that's and each one is different. The backgrounds are different. There's just something about them. Mm -hmm. Let me get you get one more. I, I think they're so fabulous. Descanso Gardens. Mm -hmm. and, and it's Actually, the real size is much, it's this big. Oh, much These bigger. are reduced, yes, they're I reduced see. and they're Xeroxes. Okay. And there's a wash put on the entire back first, and then the letters and then whatever. You do all the lettering? No, I don't, not the, with sincere you do congratulations, this part. just the Descanso Gardens. Okay, I, I exactly. just have a few because I want to show them. I think they're important. The hearts, hearts of, of fire. fire. <laughs> and you made these little hearts on fire. Well, watercolor, I love fooling around with watercolor and having it graduate from light to dark. And we have Stephen Bochco. But mm -hmm. I just think that this green and the plants are so terrific. <laughs> well, I really have fun with it. I love doing this it. This is a good one. Sushi Roki. Sushi Roki. Sushi Roku, right. <laughs> With the sushi fish. And they the just keep opening new and new sushi <laughs> bars, right? <laughs> and, and this last one that I have is for Robert Wagner, uh, which I think is great. What did, what did you put in there? Yeah, what does it say? Autry Museum of Western Heritage, uh -huh. it, it, an award with a cowboy boot and a rope. Mm -hmm. I think it's so great. I love this. <laughs> one of the things that I was thinking about when, when we were talking about these commendations and you have so much work and you do so much calligraphy, what about the computer? It hasn't put you out of business? The computer, there are two girls in the office who do computers all day long. You mean they do these on the computer? No, not, oh. not these. There's four of us doing, doing certificates that are big. And then there are so many certificates for the county that there's even more that are done oh, only on the computer. Oh, how do they differentiate? There's hundreds. I, I don't know how many a day, but I would venture to say there could be 80 a day. Huh. There, and there's a lot, and some of them come in groups. Oh, right. You know, there's a whole Boy Scout right. troop, and, and there's maybe 18. So you have to do 18 I scrolls. See, I see. I see. Yeah. You call them scrolls. I call them commendations. I don't know what else they're called. Certificates, awards, commemorative. All, yeah. Um, you've done lettering, going along with this for commercials and movie titles. Yes. Yes. I've done several. Um, oh, work for Dracula. That, Oops. Whoops. Uh -huh. um, there were letters sent back and forth to Dracula uh -huh. and uh, a deed of trust. And, and I did those kind of things for him. So they were for the movie. parts of the movie. Pa and props. We have props. We have collages, which you've also done. This is 
a collage. Inspired. <laughs> <laughs> inspired by. Um, I guess internal and external. It, it's 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 still motion and and coming and going, and the same. I. I <laughs> it appears like a book. Yes, books and doors and openings and closings and then secrets and information that's hidden behind things. Now, um, what's your favorite material? Because you oh, work in no. so <laughs> many you work in so many materials. What would be? I mean, found uh, found metal, wood, uh, calligraphy, watercolor. Collage. Oh boy! Boy, you have you, know, you really do work in it, a lot of it material, and it changes. It changes because working in silver, um, pretty my hands were getting completely ruined, and my fingernails and and hurting. And then, and working in metals, it's it's filthy. <laughs> I mean, the whole thing is filthy business. But and I can go into it for a while, and then I stop doing it and do something else. It's what about just, wood then too? You wood, I'm not. Wood? I'm not great with wood. I'm. I'm not. I just use it as a, a part of something, but I'm not a woodworker. What about going back to your original dance days? Do you think about that? Oh, always, do always, you? always. Um, one time I saw a movie with Packabell's Cannon and D, and just sat there like in tears because I wasn't dancing anymore at the time and it was devastating. Do you do anything to keep in shape? Absolutely. <laughs> oh good, tell it. What do you do? Well, I have a Pilates machine and, and I do use it. So you can train yourself, <laughs> basically. Do you do any dance, do you go to any dance classes? No, I, well I go to a yoga class and Same. I do my exercises at home, not regularly, but um, I, I'm trying to get on, my, get on it and, and do it. But as much it's as I always can. there, that influence. Always, and always. Talking to you before, I didn't realize how much the dance influenced your work. Hmm, hmm. And we can see that on the set today. Hmm, and why mm -hmm. so much the books? Why was uh, the written word such an influence? Oh, I think they just hold secrets and information that you have to be involved in it to find out what's going on. And I mean, sometimes I read and sometimes I don't read. And I think it's really uh, important. It's in, and, I, and I don't like speaking very much. It's difficult. And, um, and I feel as if the words are in there. Everything is, is in there. It's, it's hidden away. You've done it. You've I've done it. it in there. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I, I'd rather have it in there than having to force myself to pull it out of me. So. Well, I'm glad that we had your artwork on the set because we had to pull <laughs> words out of you today. <laughs> but we know they're all in the books. Judy Donnan, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Joan. I'm so glad and thank you, all of our <laughs> viewers, for watching. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, 900. 17 uh, in Los Angeles. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.